So as a physiotherapist, it's really important that we have an understanding of the medical management for DVTs. So in this video, I'm going to be highlighting to you what a DVT is and the key things that we need to do to help manage these patients in practice. So if that sounds good, let's dive in. Hey guys, I'm Khalid. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So DVT stands for deep vein thrombosis, which quite simply is described as a blood clot within the veins. A blood clot or thrombus is a mixture of blood components, including red blood cells, platelets, and fibrin, which clump together in a complex series of events known as the clotting cascade. In a deep vein thrombosis, the veins affected are not those veins you can see on the surface of your skin, but much deeper within our limbs in our body. The most commonly affected veins are within the legs and tend to be that of the femoral vein, the popliteal vein, the posterior tibial vein, and the perineal veins. Actually, 90% of all DVTs are in the lower limb and around 10% in the upper limb. This is because blood more easily pools within the veins of the lower limb and when blood remains stationary, it is more likely to activate the clotting pathways to form a clot. So as we've said, more stationary blood increases the risk of clotting and therefore DVTs. But there are other components that will also do the same. And these can be remembered with Virchow's triad. Virchow's triad was created by a German physician, Rudolf Virchow, and he identified three key components in the development of a blood clot. So the first component is stasis, when we have stationary pooling of blood. We've mentioned this already. It commonly occurs during long car journeys, long plane journeys, especially when people are dehydrated, but also can be a factor when patients are bed bound for long periods of time in hospital. All of this reduces blood flow, particularly in the legs, and thus can be an increased risk for clotting. The second component is endothelial injury. So our endothelium is the lining of our blood vessels and therefore endothelial injury means blood vessel wall injury. So this can happen when there's a trauma such as a fracture, perhaps when a needle is inserted, perhaps during a medical procedure and infections can also lead to endothelial injury in the veins. And if you're thinking about arteries, we might think about something like atherosclerosis, where we have the fatty buildup of plaque in those arteries, which can mean endothelial injury. And the third component is hypercoagulability, which simply means a person has an increased risk generally of developing a clot. This could be because of inherited factors or acquired factors. Inherited factors might be disorders such as factor V Leiden or a protein C deficiency. And acquired disorders might occur when someone has had an operation, someone who's a smoker, someone who has cancer, someone who is pregnant, or the oral contraceptive pill are all examples of where we can have acquired hypercoagulability. So that's the theory, now onto the signs and symptoms. And there are three classical signs that we see time and time again with our DVTs. Swelling, pain, and redness or heat. So swelling, quite simply, an increase in the size of the area where the clot has developed compared to the other side. Quite classically in the calf, you'll see this and you can measure the difference between the two to look at swelling. And in particular, you might see the presence of pitting edema. So this is when the limb is so swollen that when you press your finger into it, it creates an indentation that doesn't bounce back as you might expect normally when you put your finger in swelling. And that is called pitting edema. So the second is pain, and we're looking at pain specifically in the area where this clot has formed. And this is often described as a very deep, very unremitting, very excruciating pain. Once again, we see this when patients have DVTs in the calf. And the third factor, as we said, redness and heat. So you might notice that the limb appears red and almost shiny, and it might naturally be hot to touch. Now, this is often different to the redness that you see when your patient might have cellulitis, and therefore Doctors, when they're diagnosing a DVT, will often be thinking about this differential diagnosis for these patients. So it's really important to know those key three signs, but it's important to say that we can't rely on those signs only to diagnose a DVT because they're not that sensitive. And so instead, 
The WELL score was developed based on studies from 1995 to 2003 which looked at common characteristics for patients with a DVT and you can see the WELL score here on the screen now. So the idea being is that we would take our patient through the WELL score and it will come up with a number at the end. If that number is one or less, it identifies that there's a lower probability that our patient has a DVT and we can move on and consider other diagnoses. However, if our patient has a score of two or more, then it actually increases the likelihood and risk that our patient has a DVT and they should go on to have further investigations. So if the WELL score is increased, the first investigation your patient may have is a D-dimer test. This is a particular blood test where the D-dimer marker indicates inflammation. Now this can be raised in lots and lots of different medical conditions. So effectively when we do the D-dimer we're looking for a normal result, i.e. that the D-dimer is not raised because this is pretty accurate at excluding a DVT. However, if the D-dimer is raised, our patient may then go on to have an ultrasound scan specifically of the area in which the DVT is suspected so that we can use imagery to rule in or rule out the DVT. So on to treatment. If your patient is diagnosed with a DVT, they will be prescribed anticoagulant medication or blood thinning medication. Examples of these include enoxaparin, which is injection-based, warfarin, one you'll see all the time in your patient's drug histories, and more recently, the use of a particular type of drug called a DOAC, direct acting oral anticoagulants. And examples of these might include rivaroxaban or apixaban. So your patient will be using these medications for around about six months before they have a review with a haematologist. Now the haematologist may suggest at that point that they can stop the medication, but if there is perceived to be an increased risk that your patient might develop more blood clots in the future, they might be told that they have to continue taking that anticoagulant medication forever. So a couple of important and often overlooked facts about DVTs. The first is that anticoagulant medication doesn't actually break down the clot, which is popular belief. Instead, anticoagulants aim to prevent further clots from developing. And the idea is that our body aims to naturally break down the existing clots over the weeks and months ahead. The second important point is the reason we worry about DVTs, which is not really because of the DVT itself. It is because if left untreated, they are likely to form a long column of blood clots, normally in the leg. And that creates the risk of a piece of that thrombus breaking off when it is then known as an embolus and traveling to the lungs where it can lodge into the lung blood vessels, creating a PE, a pulmonary embolism, which are much more dangerous. In patients with a DVT, up to 50% can have a PE, and also if you look at patients with a PE, around a third of them will also have a DVT at that time as well. And that is why it's really important to treat them. So on to the third really important point, which is relevant to our physiotherapy management. So it was previously believed that if your patient on the ward was diagnosed with a DVT, they should be confined to bed rest. And that's because it was believed that if they were mobilized, it would encourage a piece of that clot to break off and travel to the lungs to cause a PE, or perhaps worse, travel to the brain and cause a stroke. However, that is now not the best management for these patients, as highlighted by Liu et al. 2015. They found that compared to conventional bed rest, early ambulation was not associated with progression of a DVT or the development of a PE. Secondly, they found that early ambulation also appears to help reduce the acute symptoms, and in particular, our patient's pain levels. So whilst we can't give a blanket statement because every patient is different and their symptoms and situation is different, what this does tell us is that if your patient has a DVT alone, early ambulation doesn't have to be avoided. What we would suggest is that if your patient has a DVT, make sure you check with your patient's medical team if it's okay for them to mobilize. And if you are in a ward environment, make sure it's documented in the notes so that you can make sure that you're safe for yourself as well as for your patient.
So guys, that's the end of this video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please smash that like button. We'd really appreciate your support. And you can see more of us at our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid Maidan. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you really soon right here on Clinical Physio.